Hello, my name is Michelle Herzog. I'm the History Social Science Consultant here at the Los Angeles County Office of Education, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this very special webcast about the College, Career, and Civic Life C3 Framework for Social Studies State Standards and the implications for history education. A while ago, we produced a webcast that presented an overview of the C3 Framework that featured Susan Griffin, Executive Director of the National Council for the Social Studies, and the chief architects of the document, Kathy Swan, S.G. Grant, and John Lee. In this broadcast, we want to take a deeper dive to focus on one of the important content areas found in Dimension 2 of the framework, history. The C3 framework repurposes the teaching of the social studies to prepare students for college, career, and civic life. And we all know how important the study of history is in preparing students to be engaged citizens in today's world. We're going to begin with a very brief overview of the document, and then I'm going to introduce you to two very influential leaders in history education, both of which played an important role in the development of the C3 framework. Dr. Fritz Fischer, Professor of History, Director of History Education at the University of North Colorado and past chair of the National Council for History Education. And you'll meet Dr. Chauncey Montesano, Associate Professor of the School of Education at the University of Michigan. I'm so thrilled. Thank you both for coming and being on our show today. Thank you, Michelle. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Uh, before we get started, let's remind everyone of the basic principles and design mm. of the C3 framework. We began a while ago with rationale for why we needed the C3. We were concerned, of course, about the marginalization of the social studies, concerned about how students were not motivated uh, to learn social studies, and of course concerned about the future of our democracy. The, the, the framework was designed really with two audiences in mind. For states to upgrade their so state social studies standards for this to be used as a guide in that process, but also for local schools and districts, teachers and curriculum writers, as a tool, as a framework for strengthening their own social studies programs. Before we started the work, we brought together a number of organizations and reached consensus on a definition of the social studies, which you can see in this slide. The social studies is an interdisciplinary exploration of the social sciences and humanities, including civics, history, economics, and geography, in order to develop responsible, informed, and engaged citizens and to foster civic, global, historical, geographic, and economic literacy. The goals of the C3 framework are this, to enhance the rigor of the social studies disciplines, to build critical thinking and problem solving, and of course, participatory skills that will help students become engaged citizens, and of course, the intentionality to align academic programs in social studies to the common core state standards for English language arts and, list and literacy in history social studies. This was a huge effort, over three years in the making, and you can see from this slide the numbers and the broad reach of organizations and folks that were involved in the development. Social studies leads from 23 departments of education, professional organizations, huge team of writers, teachers, editors, and of course lots of graphic designers and respondents that, that saw the document and provided feedback on it. A huge effort. These are some of the organizations that were involved in the task force, which helped informed a lot of that work. And I'm sure if you're in the social studies world, you'll recognize a number of these formidable groups who really played very key roles in informing the content of the C3 framework. The ultimate goal, we want students to study civics, economics, geography, and history, so they'll ultimately become active and engaged citizens in the 21st century. We believe the social studies taught in this way will really help impact their world and our world too. The framework is based on three foundations around an inquiry arc, and we're hearing a lot about inquiry-based education, of course, through Common Core, Next Generation Science Standards. Here it's important too. We talk about disciplinary integrity of the, of the separate subjects and disciplinary integrity of literacy that's front and center, and of course, all gearing this to inform uh, a participatory civic life. The inquiry arc of the C3 framework is framed around four dimensions. 
Um, let's take a look at each of them really quickly, and then later in our conversation, we're going to drill down and talk about them as far as history. Dimension one, we believe that starting social studies education should begin with a compelling question, this inquiry base to let's pose a question that's intellectually meaty but kid-friendly that's going to get kids excited about learning social studies. From there, we want kids to dig into content and concepts in the disciplines to help look for different points of view, evidence, and responses to those kinds of compelling and supporting questions. In Dimension 3, then, we want kids to take a lot of time to evaluate multiple sources, looking for different perspectives. You'll see some examples of that in our broadcast today. And then having kids pull evidence from those sources to reach a conclusion and lead us to Dimension 4, which is all about reaching a conclusion through an investigation, through research, looking at multiple points of view, communicating those conclusions, and then taking some informed action based on that. So very participatory, very engaging piece. For many social studies folks, this isn't really a shift in their teaching. A lot of them have been teaching this way for a lot of, a lot of years. But for some, it will be a shift. We want people to be intentional about understanding that inquiry should be at the center of social studies teaching. Disciplinary integrity and interdisciplinary connections matter. It's not just history in isolation or civics or economics or geography. They all interrelate and they all have special integrities that we want to maintain separate and together. We know that informed action and application of knowledge needs to be very much front and center. We can study for years about the causes of the Civil War, but if we can't translate some of those learnings to today's world, it makes us wonder how worthwhile and how much more powerful it could be when we approach history teaching in that way. Um, and that inquiry arc does represent an instructional arc, we hope, for teachers, a frame for teaching and, and learning. You can learn more. This uh, publication is now belongs to the National Council for the Social Studies, uh, and you can find it at the National Council for Social Studies website at socialstudies.org slash c3. So as I just mentioned, the C3 framework, we talk about involving students in an inquiry-based approach to learning about a topic or a content area by presenting a compelling question to be addressed through deep analysis of text that presents a multitude of perspectives. Fritz, talk to us some more about that. Thanks, Michelle. Well, as Michelle pointed out, the C3 begins with dimension one, which introduces the idea that developing questions is central to the idea of teaching social studies. In fact, this is what makes the study of social studies so relevant and important in our ever-changing 21st century world. Only in social studies class will students develop the skills and understandings that will allow them to question the changing world around them and to develop the method to answer such questions with reasoned, evidence-based solutions. As a historian, I feel it important to point out that this is what historians do all the time. Historians develop questions about the past and then search for and examine evidence pertaining to these questions in order to find answers to the questions. The best history classrooms need to do this as well. History classrooms should not be a place for dry recitation and regurgitation of facts and dates and names. Rather, they should be places of inquiry, experimentation, and investigation, starting with challenging, fascinating questions. Let's see how this works in the classroom. So I think a really effective approach is to like pose a controversial question um, or a question that really can have different answers. And so when you pose that question to the class, that's the, sort of the grabber. This is why we're here today. And the question is, was the US planning to go to war with Vietnam before the Gulf of Tonkin? You first need to start with an inquiry question that is that has a rich amount of answers. And then you would give out the primary source documents that they would use to like gather evidence for both sides. Our question that we are focusing on is what is the true story of the March on Washington, trying to have a complete picture of it. So the question hooks the students so that they have a purpose to the class. Um, by having uh, this focus question, they know the direction of what they have to do, and they understand that it's, the answer is not going to come from me, but it's going to come from documents. It's going to come from the history itself. Now, again, our focus is going to be, was President Johnson going to go to war anyways? 
Was it really this event, the Gulf of Tonkin, or had he already planned to go to war? And I would say that I've seen a change in their interest level in history, that instead of it being these facts that we memorize, it's this, wow, we're gonna solve a mystery or we're gonna answer some sort of question. Um, and so usually when I put up the question, you know, they'd be like, oh, look at the question today, and, th and that drives that excitement. I'd just like to make a couple of comments about that video. First, I'd like to reemphasize what that teacher, Will Colglazer, pointed out. The teacher's job is to structure the inquiry by choosing the topic, guiding the questions, and providing the evidence to be examined. The students provide the answer through their reading, sorting, prioritizing, and contextualizing the sources or the evidence. The answers don't come from the teacher, but through the student's actual in-depth engagement with this past. When done correctly, this leads to the result that Valerie Ziegler notes. It increases the interest and engagement level of the students. The students take ownership of the question. They are solving a mystery, making the exercise exciting, even fun. Importantly, it is also deeply meaningful because students must engage the actual material of history deeply and thoroughly if they are to really answer these types of questions. Chauncey, you've worked with this a great deal as well, and I know you have some interesting things to share with us too. What, what are some of your thoughts on this? Yeah, beginning classes with asking questions highlights a foundational concept in history education that historical knowledge is constructed. So in other words, historical knowledge is a product of historical study. It's not a foregone con conclusion. So as Fritz suggests, this knowledge is developed through questioning and analysis of sources and artifacts. The ultimate goal of asking questions is to investigate them and to answer them. The answer that we develop in history, they are interpretations or arguments that are grounded in the sources and artifacts that have been analyzed. And we use these sources and artifacts as evidence that support these interpretations or arguments. So in the end, this questioning leads to evidence-based interpretation or argument. History emphasizes interpretation based on evidence, which relies on a critical orientation to reading and writing. The purpose of history class is not just to repeat back information given, but to develop knowledge through an inquiry process. So the instructional task then is to design good questions to kick off investigations and give students an opportunity to develop evidence-based interpretations. Good questions have more than one plausible answer. Good historical questions are illuminated by evidence. They push us to examine sources and artifacts to develop responses. The responses are not given or known. Good questions require analysis and require students to move beyond summary. And this is different than the convention in many classrooms where questions can often act more like quizzes <coughs> to test students' factual recall. Facts and factual recall are important in history still, but they're not the end goal and the questions that call for factual recall are not the overarching frame for a history class. A question might have a yes-no question, getting back to the video, like, was Lincoln a racist? The yes-no approach can simplify the investigation of a sophisticated topic. Students tend to discover that a yes-no answer does not capture the complexity of the topic. A good question can also be more open-ended, such as, what is the true story of the March on Washington? Or, why were Japanese Americans interned during World War II, as we saw in the video? What these questions have in common is that they all have multiple possible responses. They push us to investigate evidence and require analysis. These questions drive the work that follows and invite students to participate in the process of, con of constructing new knowledge or developing evidence-based interpretations. And as Valerie Ziegler points out, this is motivating. Thank you, Chauncey. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about Dimension 2 and 3 and the idea of acquiring deep historical knowledge and skills. Content mm -hmm. learning is very important in this work. Uh, Chauncey, give us some thoughts on that, about the importance of content knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to point out that content knowledge in history includes several different things. In part, it's the specific knowledge of historical topics or the factual details. And it's also the concepts and thinking practices. We call them tools often in the C3. And these thinking practices are embedded in reading, discussing, and writing about historical sources or artifacts. These latter two might be referred to as ways of thinking or habits of mind. The C3 defers to teachers and states to select the particular topics to investigate and the factual details to master. The C3 specializes in outlining concepts and thinking practices within history and other disciplines that support historical inquiry, particularly in dimensions two and three. However, it's important to note that all forms of content knowledge are important in the study of history. Specific knowledge of historical topics supports and enables inquiry. Students have to think about something and have to use background knowledge to connect to 
and make meaning of these new topics that they investigate. At the same time, the inquiry process supports the acquisition of specific topical knowledge. In the process of investigating, students dig deeply into particular content, think about it carefully, make connections to prior knowledge, construct new knowledge, and make connections. And all of this helps students acquire and retain topical knowledge. Dimensions 2 and 3 outline key historical thinking concepts and practices that prepare students for college, career, and civic life by developing their historical thinking, an approach to thinking critically about what we read and the conclusions we come to and convey to others. Let's take a look at this video and see what this might look like in practice. In this edition of Proven to Work, investigating one of the most infamous mysteries in history. It's part of a lesson that exploits thinking skills in mixed ability groups and turns pupils into detectives. We'll be seeing the strategy in action and hearing from a top expert in education research. We'll explain why it's proven to work. The first thing these Year 8 pupils have to detect is the subject of their investigation. Why am I actually thinking it might be murder? Well, the arrow in his chest looks like he'd been murdered. It's the first way to get them engaged, to actually show them something that actually might spark their interest and what better way to do that than showing some sort of blood or gore or something like that in an image. They get, get uh, engaged straight away, they get sucked into the idea of what is this lesson about. The pupils soon work out they're looking into the death of a king and are told it's the rather suspicious death of William Rufus. The pupils are each given a different account which they must share with other members of the group and then decide what weight to give each piece of evidence. You've got a set of sources that were taken from either history books or sources from the period of time when William was killed. This lesson is um, basically intended to get the students to have a look at different types of evidence and actually communicate with evidence to one another to decide uh, what actually happened to William II. With their weapons ready, a bee suddenly ran between them. The king drew back from his place and water let fly an arrow. They really start to build on each other's ideas. They really start to consider possibilities that they wouldn't necessarily do if they were working independently. On hearing of his brother's death, Henry rode to Winchester on the 5th of August to his crown the king of England. Brother might want to kill him, so he becomes king. I love being the detective. The pupils first have to decide for themselves what happened to William and then make a group judgment. I think, I think it was an accident that Walter actually shot him. I think it was a murder because his brother would inherit it if he got if his brother died. So he could have told his men or paid his men to kill him and make it look like an accident. It means that right from the start, pupils are working independently, but at the same time relying on other members of their group. This approach could be adapted and made much more challenging by including complete red herrings in the evidence. The lesson is being observed by Philip Accordingly, director of the Centre for the Use of Research and Evidence in Education. Although they haven't assigned specific role to people, what you got the pupils to do was to think about what it means to be a good listener, what it means to be a good sharer of information, and she set up the task so it was genuinely interdependent by asking all the pupils to hold bits of information for themselves. It meant that everyone only had one piece of the information, they relied on each other. It meant that children who are slower to read were, were able to do, use their listening skills as well as their reading skills. Right then, there's been some real heavy debating going on on some of these front tables. It's actually very impressive. Was it an accident or was it a murder? Our table think it was a murder because if it was like a mishap, they would have gone over to see if he was all right and that, but in the sources it doesn't say anything about that. That was an accident because William got in the way of the arrow and it hit him. Miss, I don't think the stag even was there. I just think he just aimed at King William. This detective work is an example of thinking skills which, according to the research, can be effective across the curriculum. When you try and take uh, research and development about particular techniques that are good for deepening thinking and embed them in lots of different subjects, so there are bodies of work about thinking in, through history, thinking through English, thinking through stories, thinking through poems, thinking through uh, geography, thinking through science, so that it's it, you, the same kind of techniques exist so that the young people be begin to be skilled at the inquiry techniques and can carry them between lessons and make connections between different subjects as well as the teachers doing that. 
So let's move a little further and talk a little bit about dimensions two and three and the importance of content knowledge. We know that's very important to this work. Talk to us a little bit about the power of content concepts and how that needs to inform good history teaching, good social studies teaching in our classrooms. So we see some things related to dimension two in this video. Partly, these students are reasoning about multiple perspectives as represented in the sources they read. In thinking about multiple perspectives, students wonder why people took the actions they did or how people in another time or place viewed the world. These perspectives are represented in the primary and secondary sources, the perspectives of the people from the time of William's death and those who have written about it and thought about it since. And the range of sources push students to consider the question from different viewpoints as well as determine which evidence is reliable given the questions they're pursuing. The students in this video are also deliberating about causation as they investigate the causes of Kim, King William's death. The question, for example, is was William II's death medieval mishap or murder? Understanding both perspectives and cause and effect relationships are key civic skills as well as key concepts in understanding history. We also see some features of dimension two and three in, in this video that relate to history education. The students in the video attend to historical sources and evidence, as is listed in Dimension 2. They also evaluate sources and develop claims using evidence from those sources, as is a key part of Dimension 3. In studying history, students deliberate about secondary and primary sources that give them insight into another time and place. This can mean a number of different things. Thinking critically about we, what we read includes things like attention to authorship and the author's purpose and intention or motivation as well as the author's worldview. It also includes attention to context. For example, what people write is situated in particular times and places, different worldviews happening at that time and place. So we have to understand people's circumstances or their context in order to understand what we read. So in reading primary and secondary sources and evaluating that evidence, students are not just reading for information that is literally stated within the text, but they also take a critical stance to text and consider the circumstances surrounding the creation of the text to understand what it really means. This type of reasoning about historical evidence is key in history. In addition to evaluating the sources, we see in the video students develop claims about King William's death based on that evidence. They decide what weight to give different pieces of evidence, and they make judgments based on that evidence. A little bit different teaching a history than when I went to school, for <laughs> sure, where we just basically read through the chapters in the textbook and took it as fact and moved on. Mm -hmm. So this approach is very complicated, very difficult, but certainly pushes kids to develop those high-level thinking skills yeah. in the context of the content, as you mentioned. Fritz, you have a lot of experience in this. Talk some more to us about this complexity of multiple perspectives. Well, as Chauncey suggests in the video, we see that uh, critical to the study of history is learning how to find, understand, contextualize, and utilize historical sources in answering questions. In the C3, we find this concept in a number of places within Dimension 2. Uh, for example, history indicator number 11 looks like this. Um, we see here that students are being asked to do a whole range of things with sources that seems to be very complicated. Some teachers may think that this is too challenging and difficult to do, even in an advanced high school class. But properly organized, critiquing and analyzing sources can and should become the centerpiece of a very effective class, even for relatively young students. Let's take a look at a class of middle schoolers as they wrestle with sources about Abraham Lincoln. As you'll see in the video, the teacher has set up a whole set of questions about the extent to which Lincoln was a racist at various times of his political career, and the students examine these questions based on a set of sources from Abraham Lincoln. Today our topic of the Socratic seminar is Abraham Lincoln and his revolving views on race and ending slavery. Definitely changed his views on slavery altogether because before I think he was, he didn't really see everything that was bad about it because he was, he was a white man and they, he had no experience with that. I think he had, he was blind considering that he was raised a totally different way with his family and all of that. So he finally had um, enough time by then to see, really see how bad and how morally wrong slavery was. Um, he was part of the reason, I think, why he said all the things that he did that, um, like he said, that he doesn't agree that African Americans are his equal. He wanted to get votes. So his whole, his whole point was to win the election. And I think that 
like he does say, but in the right to eat the bread, which his own aunt earns, like as he said, uh, he is my equal and the equal of every living man, because he did think that. And when he, I think he did think that all the way up until he signed the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, but he didn't want to speak his, he couldn't speak his mind, as Zoe said also, that he couldn't have done that earlier because he needed the votes and he needed people to be on his side. It says, God himself has made them for usefulness as slaves and has required us to employ them as such. So they believed that slaves were less because of what God put on them. I mean, record someone to f like find out if he's a racist, Donald Sterling, but like back then, like you're you're a racist if you're a slave owner. Like that's like the idea of a racist. Try to convince him, like, oh, maybe you should let them go. They seem like a family. Try to keep them together. But no, he watched them be separated and go their different paths. Even though he says and agrees that he's an abolitionist, it doesn't happen until Document B, where he talks to Frederick Douglass and invite him to the White House, explaining how can I stop how can I stop slavery, and that's when he came up with the Emancipation Proclamation. Until it was too late and everybody was at war. This is certainly an extraordinary discussion with students making very astute, thoughtful observations about the questions based directly on the sources right in front of them. It's not all about their opinion, although as you can see, they intersperse their discussion of the sources with their own opinions on issues of race. So in this way, the student voice is respected, but it's based on a reading, understanding, and interpretation of historical text. Note that the teacher is both missing and present here. The teacher does not participate directly in the discussion, but has created a tight and clear set of rules that guide the discussion. Students can't get to this level on the first try, but properly prepared, almost any student has the ability to reach this level. I'd also like to note the rich content we see here. A critical concept in the understanding of history is the idea of change over time. In fact, that concept is expressed in the C3, in history indicator number two. The students correctly note the difference between Lincoln's ideas on race during the Lincoln-Douglas debates and his views in the Emancipation Proclamation half a decade later. They speculate as to the causes of this difference and this engenders an interesting discussion. This then leads the students to pose some interesting arguments about why Lincoln changed his views. Of course, this is an important learning goal in a history class, asking the students to utilize sources to craft arguments about what happened in the past. Once again, we see this in the C3 in history indicator number 16, which, as we can see, is all about crafting arguments, which is the end result of a lot of excellent history teaching. In the end, history needs to be about more than studying the words of the past. Students need to be encouraged to use these words and ideas to create an answer, their own answer, about what those words mean and why they are important. And in this video, we can see just how powerful such an activity can be. So you both bring up really important issues and the complexity of this and, and what it causes for teachers to do to, to help students. You know, when I think of the, the current issues and problems of the world, these horrific terrorist attacks overseas, um, immigration issues, Keystone Pipeline, these are big problems with very complex solutions. We, we hope that policymakers are going to go at these problems with the same ideas and approaches that you're discussing, that they look at different perspectives, that they look at the historical context, the geographic, the economic, the political consequences, dig deeply. These don't come automatically, this type of thinking, and so it's exciting to think about if we can teach this next generation in the ways you're describing, think of how powerful that could be for the future of our world, the universe. We're all very aware of how important social studies is to understanding the complexities of the past. And Cicero himself once said, not to know your past is to forever remain a child. And that's what takes us to dimension four, which is an important place in history education as well, to be able to reach conclusions based on this analysis of multiple perspectives, as you've both discussed so well, apply that knowledge and those thinking skills to address the questions issues that are important to the world and important to young people in their lives today. So Chauncey and Fritz, talk to us a little bit more about this important aspect of history education and how it prepares students, not just for college and career, but for really civic life in the real world. Thanks, Michelle. As you mentioned, this is really important uh, for thinking about everyday questions. As a matter of fact, I think it's the payoff for students. We've seen students learning how to think and argue about big issues in the past, 
uh, from the reasons the U.S. got involved in the Vietnam War to the extent to which Abraham Lincoln was a racist and to what extent his, his views changed over time. Mm -hmm. At the core, these are huge, important concepts that students will be wrestling with their entire lives as American citizens. Should the U.S. go to war? Why or why not? What complex factors are involved? Do they see racism, racism in their own lives today? How has this changed from the past, and how might it change in the future? Have their own views evolved on race or on the issues of war and peace? So, yes, history can and should be fun and engaging just for its own sake. I, I certainly think it is, but then again, I like to call myself a history nerd. But everyone, every citizen, needs to engage questions on such issues as racism and as war and why we go to war. That's the application, right? Yeah. So, which is so critical. Chauncey, I know you've got some, some thoughts on this too. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I think history education prepares students for college, career, and for civic life by involving students in the processes of an evidence-based reasoning. They're doing it themselves. They're developing conclusions based on evidence. History emphasizes interpretation based on evidence, and that relies on a critical orientation to reading and writing. And the reading and writing necessary for historical understanding and thinking also prepare students for college, career, and civic life. An inquiry approach to history and social studies relies on reading informational texts and writing arguments, as well as listening and speaking. So although this is not the common core, the work students will do in C3 classrooms is well aligned with the common core. And we all know the common core is focused on college and career, and then the C3 brings in the civic life focus. One cannot ask questions and investigate in history without strong reading skills, nor can one communicate conclusions without strong writing and speaking skills. So ultimately, we see reading, thinking, and writing are integrated in the study of history. The informational texts we've been talking about include primary and secondary sources, like the ones we've seen in the videos. Argument writing requires students to develop and communicate their conclusions and to support them with evidence Recall this kind of evidence-based reasoning is a core purpose of history education. And in writing evidence-based arguments, students learn that the strongest claims have evidence to support them and address that evidence that may challenge their claims. We can't ignore that. History education, though, is not just about college and career. It's also about civic life. And it prepares students for civic life by giving students knowledge and thinking practices that can help them make sense of our world today. Developing an understanding of the past can help us understand the present. To come to a conclusion about Obama's executive order on immigration, for example, it's important to understand the history of the U.S. Constitution, why it was formed the way it was, and the history of immigration policy, among other things. Another way in which you prepare for civic life as you, read, as, as you study history is in learning how to read in particular ways, so that when you read the news, you notice if your news is coming from the LA Times or the Wall Street Journal or even the National Enquirer. These are important things to notice to get a sense of the perspective of, of the writers and, and the news that you're taking in, what's being presented to you. And another way that this relates to pre preparation for civic life is that we do a lot of research in history education and we use information on the web. And students are using the web all the time. So they learn through history education to ask, who are the authors of the websites that we're looking at? What, were, what are their intentions? When was the last update of the website? Uh, so these are questions students learn by working in the study of the past, and they can bring to their present day lives as a citizen. So evidence-based reasoning, critical reading and writing, historical thinking, these are key aspects of the C3 that support the Common Core and prepare students for college, career, and for civic life. Yeah, I'm really glad you reiterated those points, Chauncey, and it reminded me something you said about Common Core. You know, even states that haven't adopted Common Core, I gotta believe that everyone in our nation wants young people to be highly literate, to be able to decipher and, and look at different points of view, whether they get their news from MSNBC or Fox or wherever, look at different internets. You want them to be smart consumers of news and information. You want our future leaders to be smart consumers of news and information, and the citizens who vote them into office to pay attention to that too. All of those are adapted, learned skills that they can get in good historical thinking, in good teaching of social studies, as, as we've seen in the videos and we've both described. So it's an exciting time 
it's an exciting time, and I think it's something students will be excited about in learning in this way. You've both seen it, I've seen it too. It makes it fun for teachers too. It's so exciting to see it happen in real classrooms. The teachers get into it, the students get into it. It's hard work, but they really learn so much, and it's more interesting to dive deep into these topics and think critically about them. I think that's what I love about history education. It prompts more questions mm -hmm. sometimes than answers, mm -hmm. and that's okay, yeah. right? Um, I think it wasn't until eighth grade till I had a teacher who taught in this way, and I have to tell you, it really sparked my interest mm -hmm. in history and led to me to become a history nerd <laughs> when I went on and got my degree in history. Um, it's, it's exciting. So to have this as an opportunity for all kids, even with the little young ones, they can do this too, can't yes. they? Yeah. yeah. I think it's important to emphasize that there have been teachers who have been doing this for, for quite a long time. Yeah, this absolutely. isn't a brand new invention. Yeah. And uh, the, the ideas behind this um, have been researched for two or three decades um, as strong ways for kids to learn in the classroom. And history education specialists and historians have been uh, supporting ideas like this in the for use in the classroom for a couple decades. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a new invention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. But it's exciting to see it now validated more, yes. um, promoted more, supported more. The C3, even Common Core speaks to the importance of this. So mm -hmm. I think that's what got us so excited about some of these reforms and educational yeah. initiatives that are, that are coming forward. Mm -hmm. There's a number of other resources that are out there. We can't make them fast enough because <laughs> we're trying to take advantage of this new, this new um, culture of education and us moving forward. Um, here's just a few, and you'll see on some of these slides. Um, teaching History, teachinghistory.org, the Historical Thinking Project. Um, I know you're going to take some time to look at these uh, websites. The Stanford History Education Group has been doing this for many years, as you mentioned, Fritz. Historical Thinking Matters. Sam Weinberg, we attribute a lot of that to his work and Bob Bain's work. They've been just doing remarkable things well before C3, well before Common Core. Digital History, our friends at the Library of Congress, the National Archives, Center for History and New Media, all of these folks have lots of great information and resources, really at no cost, too. A lot of it is available. In World History, the World History for Us has a great approach to the same type of concepts. Um, again, the Stanford History Group, Women in History, lots of great places to get information. Um, and of course, we, we need to do a shameless plug for Chauncey's new book that just came out, which is getting rave reviews, kind of linking that whole aspect of literacy, argumentative writing in a very practical, user-friendly book. Um, you can find that at Teachers College. It's reading, thinking, and writing about history. Um, and she's done some training, just did a big training here at LACO with a huge group. They walked away just thrilled. Um, so it's great to see these things in practice and people picking them up and using them in powerful ways. Mm -hmm. It's a great time. It's a really great, exciting time. And of course, I have to steer you all to the National Council for the Social Studies um, because that's where the C3 lives at socialstudies.org slash C3. We are creating a number of resources, journals, conferences. We now have some um, funding at NCSS from the Gates Foundation to create some online professional development modules that'll be free and available. So we encourage all everyone in our social studies community to take advantage of that and be involved. And I want to thank the two of you for being so involved with NCSS as well. We're just moving and shaking, trying to move things forward as much as we can. Um, I want to take this opportunity to really thank you, it, both of you, for sharing your insights about the C3 framework and, of course, the importance of history education and how the C3 impacts and strengthens history education in all the ways we've already known we're good, but now we can add this uh, to further strengthen our work. I want to thank Dr. Fritz Fisher and Dr. Chauncey Montesano. Thank you both for flying across the country and <laughs> being with us today. Thank you. Ha happy to be in warm California. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. It's a little different great. than scraping ice off the windshield. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's great. Thank you for coming. And of course, I have to thank our wonderful tech crew here at LACO, led by Tyler Cook. Uh, the entire crew, Jeff Reyna, all of them just do fabulous work for us, as you can see in this production. And of course, I need to thank the, my wonderful Division of Curriculum and Instructional Services, uh, where I work, led by our director, Raynette Sanchez, and Assistant Director, Yvonne Contreras. Their wonderful support and leadership. They, I can't do this work without their support, so I'm just forever grateful to them. Um, so you're welcome, audience, to continue to explore the resources, ideas, and strategies for implementing the C3 framework 
for social state standards, as I mentioned, at the National Council for Social Studies website. NCSS is the leading organization for social studies educators. And as I mentioned, we're continuing to update our site with all kinds of opportunities, professional development, conference, bulletins, on and on and on. So we hope that's your one-stop shop, but then, of course, explore all the other things that are available for free. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very exciting time. And so, um, to close, we quote retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who said that knowledge of our system of government and rights as citizens is not passed down through the gene pool, though we wish it was. <laughs> it must be taught. And the college, career, and civic life framework will help each state improve civic learning for all students. Thank you for joining us today. We wish you the best of luck as you continue to promote and strengthen social studies education for all your students.